Well, thank you for all staying to begin with. Uh, usually when I talk about economics, I usually can clear the room. So uh, it's a moral victory that you've stayed. Anyway, so we'll see. Um, so in the next 20 minutes, what I want to do is talk about the economics of institutional design, sort of a, a branch of economics, and the relevance of that sort of research agenda uh, to understanding Brexit and the Northern Irish economy. So I want to start with two quotes, which I think are nice uh, maxims, as we'll see uh, later on in the presentation. One is from Einstein, in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity, because obviously uh, something we're going to see later on is there's a branch of economics that attempts to see when large ruptures to institutional structures, such as we're experiencing with Brexit, can lead to favourable outcomes. So I'll talk about that later on in the presentation. And it's discussed in far more detail in my note that you have in your pack. And secondly, the quote from Seneca, his dictum, if one does not know to which port one is sailing, no one is favourable. In other words, what does Brexit mean, Brexit actually mean in practice in terms of economics? So this is a paper uh, in 140 character tweet as much about the use and misuse of economics and policy making as anything else. So I've given a little overview of what I hope to do in 20 minutes. I say hope, we'll see what I, if I do it in 20 minutes, but that's what I hope to do. Uh, that's the plan. Um, so what I'm going to do is, obviously, I wrote this note in August, pr uh, primarily. So I put in some observations since the note. Uh, then some of the major points I want to get through is I think in the issue of the Northern Irish economy, there are two fundamental sets of policymaking problems. One is the continual misdiagnosis of the problems of the Northern Irish economy that I think last the present day. And secondly, uh, related, is problems of implementation of uh, policy responses. I think both have been, uh, if we look at the long run history of economic policy in Northern Ireland, uh, which I could bore you, for many hours on, but I won't. I've only got 20 minutes to bore you. Uh, I will uh, say that both of these have been an issue. Um, then in terms of the economics profession, uh, I'll talk a bit about, again, the bad workman, or indeed back, uh, work woman, uh, blaming their tools. So why did econo the economics profession have such a bad referendum? We'll talk about three interrelated processes in the Northern Irish economy and the relevance of institutional analysis. So that's, that's the plan in 20 minutes, a lot. OK, so some observations since I wrote the note in August. That is, it's pretty clear if I was doing a technical economic seminar, there's the whole literature on what's called Pareto compensation of where winners and losers from an economic, um, the winners from an economic uh, situation are able to compensate the losers and leave nobody worse off. That's all very nice on whiteboards of seminar rooms, of economic seminars at Queen's. The reality is the world doesn't necessarily work like that. And what we're seeing, particularly in the light of the previous presentation, is many of the people who voted to leave uh, are the people who have been made worst off by the economic repercussions of the leave vote. That is to say, those on fixed incomes or low incomes spend a higher proportion of their income on food and fuel than those on higher incomes. And people, and of course, with the devaluation of sterling that's gone on since the referendum, those are exactly the goods that are going to become most expensive. So that's something to bear in mind uh, when thinking about these things. Uh, we also could think about how uh, one of the reasons why the economics profession, I think, got a lot of the forecasting so wrong uh, is that they forgot something that we teach people in first year undergraduate economics and then everybody promptly forgets about is the role of expectations. In other words, something can have an impact on the economy, even if it never happens, but it has an impact on the economy because you expected it to happen. So a lot of the, th a lot of the things we should have observed at the time uh, were actually reflecting expectations about what was going to happen rather than what actually did turn out. So those are just some observations since the note. Anyway, so into the note itself, again, I refer you uh, a lot of the comments I could make about economics in general. 
link into a previous CAS seminar earlier this year by my colleague, Professor Rob Gillis. Uh, again, if you're interested in more general literature on institutional mm -hmm. economics, I would urge you to have a look at that little introduction, so I'm not going to cover all that. But what I think it's important to understand when we think about the EU referendum and Brexit is there's been a narrow focus among some within political administrative class to focus on flows of EU funds when thinking about the, e the impact of Brexit on the Northern Irish economy. But actually, if we're thinking about long-term economic prospects of Northern Ireland, uh, there are other mechanisms that are actually far more important at work. Um, and of course, the flow of funds, as Esmond Burney points out, that comes from Westminster to Belfast is a multiple of any funds from EU. So really, if we're going to look at flows of funds, it's the funds from uh, GB to Northern Ireland that are far more meaningful economically than any Brussels funds. Not to say they're insubstantial, but in the big scheme of things, for understanding Northern Ireland economy, it's not nearly as important. Uh, there's a variety of economic studies that have been mentioned. I'm not going to go rehearse this. I've only 20 minutes. I want to make points that will not have necessarily been made before and maybe introduce you to some literature <coughs> that you won't have come across before because I think they're more insightful to understand what's going on. Uh, first observation is that many trends and observations on the economy uh, can, we can just blame or attribute to Brexit, but many of these trends are processes that pre long predate the process of Brexit. The most obvious one, based upon forthcoming work of Esmond Burney, uh, is the move towards uh, a variety of fiscal, uh, fiscal decentralisation, fiscal devolutions. Uh, the long protracted story about corporation tax being only the most uh, famous. The other point, of course, is that, uh, as some have pointed out, there has been a competitive uh, boost to parts of the Northern Irish economy, for instance, agri-food, uh, from exchange rate decline. But uh, if we looked at more detail and more time, we could say, well, some of those issues uh, are not so clear-cut for the simple reason that some sectors of the economy are not so price-sensitive. Okay? Different sectors of the economy some are highly price sensitive, some not so price sensitive. In other words, uh, agri-foods will be highly price sensitive because you're competing in a commodity market where price is king. If you're talking about high technology products, aerospace, etc., etc., there is an obviously price sensitivity, but nowhere near uh, that degree of price sensitivity. So simply looking at depreciation of sterling as a miraculous mechanism to get the UK economy out of a post-Brexit hole uh, I think we should be a bit uh, sceptical about. Now, the economics profession uh, during Brexit, I think, was guilty of a lot of spurious precision, a lot of forecasts that were very precise. Uh, but if you actually look closely at the economic theory underlying uh, some of the forecasts, it was spurious. There was really no good, solid theoretical uh, explanation or justification for some of these numbers. And perhaps what I'm saying in terms of the use and abuse of economics is that one of the lessons of the whole Brexit situation is to remind us that when we think about economic policy making, uh, there's a, a rule for thinking about the art or the rule of judgment in choosing which po uh, tools, which theories we use when we think about economic policy making. In other words, there's been a lot of emphasis placed upon the science of forecasting I could put science in inverted commas. Uh, I think what, one of the things that Brexit shows us is the ability to judge and choose judiciously uh, different models, that's a, more an art, that's not a science, is something that in the economics profession we really need to think about far more than we did. So if I look reviewing the economics debate, uh, the economics profession had a bad... Uh, Referendum. That is to say, the elite of the profession, so like 10 Nobel laureates wrote a letter to the Guardian. Those Nobel laureates had a range of ideological viewpoints, so it wasn't a left or right thing. It was people like Jim Heckman, Chicago professor, quite free market. And then there were people like George Akerlof, Berkeley, far more Keynesian. 
those people were uni unified at the elite of the profession of being sceptical about the economic repercussions of Brexit. In contrast, the Brexiteers are a far more homogenous group, that, that group of Brexit or economists. We're far more homogenous. I could talk about that in questions and answer. Now, economic, the economics profession, I have to say, didn't, as a, as a, a breed or as a, a, a brethren, do a particularly good job during the referendum debate uh, in winning hearts and minds. You know, when you're opening gambit is talking about nominal GDP, that generally will help clear the room. Uh, and I'm, I'm surprised nobody's run yet. But uh, so it's a bit of a moral victory, as I said earlier on. So what was the intellectual consensus? Well, the intellectual consensus were those of short-run transition costs. Or if you want to be technical, there was talk about what's called the J-curve. In other words, that the uh, output response from Brexit should initially have been downturn, followed by an upturn if you're optimistic, or a very lag, slow, or non-existent upturn if you're a pessimist. Or another technical way to put it, uh, which I'll talk about later on, is the impact, what was the actual economic impact from 1972 to the present day of the UK being in the EC, EU, etc. Well, economists looking at that have, have come to the uh, conclusion that it's really what's called a transmission mechanism process. A transmission mechanism is simply this technical idea. We could call it a tug of war. There's basically a tug of war in the British economy between poor management or poor industrial relations that tends to drive down productivity and product market competition that tends to promote productivity. The, con the great contribution of the EEC or EU or whatever iteration of the European community you want to say was that it promoted product market competition. Now for us in Northern Ireland, the bad news is, is we don't have good empirical studies of this phenomenon, okay? But there is a clue. We do know from existing empirical studies, obviously, that our productivity lags GB, and that management quality lags GB, and we also know that our uh, tendency for product market competition is weaker than the rest of the United Kingdom. So by withdraw withdrawing that tug of war impact, that positive impact of the EU, you could argue that that is going to have a net detrimental impact to the Northern Irish economy. Far more important than the actual uh, net flows of money coming from Brussels. Far more important as a piece of economics. Now, uh, if we think about productivity uh, problems, they are ultimately solvable by supply-side reforms. So what I want to do in the rest of the presentation is talk a bit about the economic debate of Brexit in the Northern Irish context. And stupidly, I put my most important points towards the end of my presentation, so you have to rush through the most important points, but I am an economist. Um, so the... Observation, we could say, since the great financial crisis is unlike, say, the Republic of Ireland, that Northern Ireland, but in common with many other parts of the United Kingdom, uh, the, basically the Great Recession has been characterised by the, benefit, the benefits been concentrated in the southeast of England relative to the rest of the United Kingdom. And Northern Ireland shares that phenomenon. So as I said earlier on, we don't have a Northern Ireland specific study of the transmission mechanism, but the evidence that we have in terms of product market competition and management suggests that Northern Ireland will be affected because it has weaker product market competition and weaker management. In other words, the benefit of being an EU for Northern Ireland of product market competition is lost if we don't replace that spur to product market competition. Also, the evidence from the guy who's done most research in this area, Nick Crafts of, uh, of the University of Warwick, is all the econometric evidence on deregulation. And I worked in the DTI a long time ago. And while people are keen often to talk about cutting red tape, the fact is, of the feasible deregulations there are to cut post-Brexit, 
None of the econometric models suggest that these deregulation initiatives are going to have very much impact on the rate of growth. So, you know, uh, the deregulation benefit of Brexit, there may be other benefits of Brexit, but I think looking at deregulation as the, the, the mechanism for Northern Ireland is not the avenue to go down. What it does suggest, and I, I wrote my note obviously in, um, in August before Theresa May's conference speech, and basically what Brexit does, it has nudged or accelerated the process of the move towards what's known as fourth generation industrial policy. Again, I could bore for an hour on fourth generation industrial policy, indeed the other three generations, but I won't. I'll just say there's a fourth generation industrial policy, economists have talked about it for a long time, Brexit has basically made inevitable the shift towards that industrial policy. What is fourth generation industrial policy in the remaining two or three minutes? Um, fourth generation industrial policy is industrial policy where you create an environment which isn't sector specific. Okay, so in other words, you're not picking winners in a sector specific kind of way, you're creating an environment where all parts of the economy can flourish. From a Northern Irish point of view, the big caveat is while I think that's correct as a piece of economic analysis, the big caveat for Northern Ireland is the role of agri-food. In other words, ordinarily I think uh, a sector neutral industrial policy is the way to go. But in the context of Northern Ireland, I do think agri-food has issues that we can talk about later on that means we might want to deviate from that fourth generation micro policy. In other words, once again, Northern Ireland might have to deviate from the rest of the United Kingdom and its micro-policy. Again, there's a long and not particularly distinguished history of that. Uh, again, we can talk about it later on. I'm not going to go into the bits at the end, the final slides in your pack. What I'll leave it with is this final slide, which is the most important slide, is I think to understand the Northern Irish economy, we have to understand that there are three processes going on. And these three processes predate Brexit and post-date Brexit. In fact, you might even argue Brexit is not particularly uh, crucial to any of these three processes. These three processes, in other words, are what really drives the Northern Irish economy. One is that uh, Northern Ireland has a set of processes that are basically economic. UK-wide processes. Many of those processes are shared with the Republic of Ireland. A second set of processes with rebalancing and productivity weakness are actually magnified versions of British problems. And the last uh, set of problem is Northern Irish specific issues. So you can think about the border, the fact that Northern Ireland alone in the United Kingdom shares a border, uh, the exchange rate impact of that, the issue of tax competition on the island that people often don't talk about, but Esmond and myself do in our paper. And, of course, legacy issues and peace building. So what I'm saying, in essence, is that over time, these three issues exist in the Northern Irish economy. They fluctuate in their relative importance over time. Uh, Brexit is merely going to be a manifestation of these three issues because, for instance, the whole issue about hard borders, soft borders, etc., kicks in to the fact that we have this uh, issue C, but it doesn't materially impact the fact that these three processes uh, exist. So what, what I'm going to say in conclusion, therefore, uh, and you'll see it in the note, is that there is a literature associated with Oliver Williamson, who won the Nobel Prize. We're in Nobel Prize for Economics Week. It was announced on Monday. So if we talk about a previous Nobel laureate, Oliver Williamson, and he talks in a 2000 paper about why is it so difficult for countries hit by institutional shocks to make a success of it. The two successes he highlights are the Meiji Restoration, 1868, a wee while ago, and the more recent uh, institutional breaks associated with the Rogernomics uh, boom of New Zealand. I've, written, I've previously worked in New Zealand, I've worked in Rogernomics. I'm not so sure it was as uh, positive as Oliver Williamson thought, but anyway, the point is that there are windows of opportunity in these sorts of processes, sort of Einstein's point. Uh, but nine times out of ten, uh, Williamson would say we mishandled them. In fact, Williamson in the article actually highlighted 
the failure of the EU to reform itself as a classic example of uh, a failure to take windows of opportunity. So if we're thinking about, as I do in the note, the draft programme for government, we don't just think about the measurability of objectives, which is a massive improvement we went before in the current draft programme for government. I think that's all to the good. But in terms of economic uh, analysis, there are a lot of issues about, about uh, trade-offs and equity and efficiency that I don't think are there in the draft programme for government. And if we think of the draft programme for government post-Brexit, I think that, that will throw up some other issues to think about. Well, thank you for your forbearance. I've tried to stick to the 20 minutes. Thank you.